call the December 19th school committee meeting to order. Uh, tonight we'll, we'll, we'll stick to the uh, order of the agenda as printed. Uh, so we'll start with, with uh, open uh, public input, consent agenda reports, and then we, under the new business kind of, I won't, they're not end of year reports, they're I guess end of calendar year reports uh, from personnel and budget. Uh, and uh, and then we'll continue on our uh, discussion of the social media policy and uh, and we'll have a discussion on the uh, uh, some revisions in the superintendent's evaluation process uh, followed by an executive session uh, uh, with us possibly coming out of executive session and back into open session. So, uh, having said that, Excuse me. Uh, yes, oh. having said that, is there any uh, public comment? That's something that's not on the agenda. No. Okay, uh, you had a motion for the consent agenda? Yes, move to approve the consent agenda. Second. Thank you. Is there, if there's a second, is there anything anyone will, yes, Mr. Wise. Um, I request that we pull out the December 12th meeting minutes. And then I just have a couple of quick points on other things for the committee's awareness. December 12th is going to be a pretty straightforward change, so we might approve it afterwards pretty quickly, but just wanted a minor technicality to be approved. You can't hear over there? No, I can't hear. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Since when, that's not usual. <laughs> I said the December 12th one is probably a minor, a real quick minor change. I think it, we can probably adapt it real quick. Um, I'll just go to it if you don't mind, uh, Mr. Chair. Is there, yeah. Any objections? Okay, yeah. go ahead. Um, so in the ha high school handbook section, it says a committee has been formed to, re to review the high school handbook. Um, in particular, it's the school council. It's not any committee, right? So I was just suggesting that we change that to the school com school council has met and discussed the plan to review and revise the high school handbook um, instead of a committee has been formed. And then following that, the next sentence, it says the committee has set a goal. I would just say the council has set a goal. Um, very simple, straightforward change, but. So, I mean, I propose, I'd accept friendly those amendment. as friendly amendments to the original motion. Oh. One other change, because the motion might align to the consent agenda. Technically, we don't have December 19th minutes yet, so we shouldn't approve minutes that we don't have yet. Did I miss that? Sorry. It just says Sorry. November 7th, December 12th, and December 19th. We're here today, so nope. we don't have December 19th, so we can't approve our minutes oh, today yet. Great. Um, and then... No, the 19th is the year. Oh, is that Okay. <laughs> 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 Thank you. Um, I'm used to four-digit years, but thank you for clarifying. That that helps me a lot. <laughs> I was thinking today's the 19th. How are we approving today? There's a yeah. comma there. <laughs> yep. Well, there's commas when we do multiple dates at the same time as well, so that's why the clarification. But thank you, uh, Ms. Engelson. I appreciate that. Um, one other quick point, I guess. Um, well, two, one quick point and then one question. Um, the Harpley Foundation, um, one that we received, that donation is for $1,500. Um, I quickly looked in there. I love that donation, first of all. I love the fact that Mr. McSweeney had it. Um, but what that donation will cover is two years. So the committee should just be aware that if we want to continue that high school news, newspaper, online newspaper afterwards, it will, it will be something we have to fund. We've already had that conversation with Mr. McSweeney. Yeah, it's actually a student activity, so we would not fund it. They would need to fund it. They would need it. to fund it in yep. some way, shape, or form? Okay. Yep. So that it's a one-time setup fee of $250, an annual fee of $400. So it would cover two annual fees and a one-time setup fee. Um, and then the last point of discussion, I guess, or, or whatnot, is the November 7th minutes included um, all of the feedback on the GNAP, GNAP survey and NISAC and all that stuff. And in particular, it said if we want to file an MSBA thing, we need to do it in January. Um, so I don't know if we're planning to do that this January or next January, but it would seem like we are we're going to be up against the wire if we try to do it for this January. So, so that that was based on conclusions drawn by GNAP that we were ready to go with this Correct. this year, mm -hmm. and uh, I think I said that. And I'm not. I wasn't ever ever uh, uh, advocating that we 
that we rush to get something done by January. We have to do it right. You know, so. Okay. So and I, that is one further point. That was an illustrative timeline based upon when the MSBA process is open. It wasn't necessarily meant to be definitively this. It would just be January is typically when they open it for the process so a january right so not necessarily not next this, not but this i just january. want the, the yep. public to be aware yep. of the fact that that means that we won't be applying for msba next year correct right and it's probably the year after that if, if through the public comment period and all that kind of fun stuff we decide there's something we're going to go for um so that might not have been clear in november i just want to make sure that's clear now okay All those in favor? Of the as amended? As amended, yeah. Okay. Six zero. Okay, we'll uh, go into reports. Since you're not on the docket, Dr. Stice, you have a <laughs> um, I just have one quick thing. Um, because we are in the tiered focus monitoring um, process, the state has sent an email to all parents whose students are currently receiving special education services. The state has identified there's been a glitch in some, um, some of the emails going out. So we posted on our website and the CPAC has sent out if anyone has not received a survey or if they'd like a paper copy of a survey or if they have more than one child, they just need to contact Andrew McKenzie at the state and they will get one out. Um, to them immediately and all that's posted on the website again so that was it great thank you Ms. Kelly I don't have any reports tonight great. John Dr. Dart I have a I have one um, do you remember last week uh, Mrs. Dowd talked about that we have been invited to a school safety initiative um, workshop this week which actually happened on Wednesday um, and I, w I was able to attend so I just want to give a brief report it was um, the following groups were represented I, I was one of eight superintendents that it, that attended um, these were all by invitation only by the way US Secret Service the FBI there were selected police departments the fire departments Homeland Security the Commonwealth Fusion Center um, the Massachusetts Partnership for Youth uh, there was a representation from public relations firms. All in total, 39 people were invited. And, uh, it, was, it was coordinated by uh, the Secret Service and FBI were the ones that facilitated the conversation. And the whole purpose of this is moving forward, they want to find a way to bring all of the organizations that I just mentioned together to improve public school safety across Massachusetts. So this is... It sounds simple, but to get all of these groups together in a coordinated fashion is very complex. And so this was a first step on how can we, we do this. So they want to focus on the following areas. One is building meaningful relationships between adults and students, a whole uh, emphasis on coordination and collaboration. Um, how do you make people feel safe and be safe in schools, which sometimes is two different things. Um, how do you focus on both behavior and prevention? Uh, looking at things like bullying and the social stressors that certain students have. And then taking a look at best practices in school security, which include the relationships that you have with your school resource officer, um, the physical piece, uh, which when I walked away, I felt really good that everything that we've been working on uh, with the security study and the implementation of that is right in line with the best practices that I heard there in terms of moving forward, enhancing the things that you do, that you have. Don't get too fancy, um, but really make um, solidified the, the things um, that you already have in place. They talked about cultural shifts, uh, single points of entry and exit as much as possible out of buildings, school buildings. Um, and then the other piece was creating an effective threat assessment team. And that's a, that's a big one that is, is starting to gain a lot of momentum across the country is how do you create these threat assessment teams that can identify problems in advance so that you can 
minimize the, uh, the impact. So when, in terms of creating a, a violence prevention plan, um, you want to make sure that you have a really strong threat assessment team, and that can either be at the school level or the district level, and it should be from all stakeholders um, in, that, that are associated with, with the, the school personnel and uh, police, fire, represent, re representation as well. And they would direct, manage, and document a threat assessment process. Um, you want to make sure that you can define behaviors that are concerning and that are unacceptable and that warrant immediate attention, both school-wide and in, from an individual perspective. You want to create a central reporting mechanism um, on how this is communicated. Um, you want to make sure that you determine uh, where law enforcement comes in and what, when they're involved and when they're not involved, um, which I believe we have some pretty good pieces in place now with um, our school resource officers and when they're involved and when they're not involved. We want to make sure that we establish assessment procedures that identify, so that all stakeholders are aware of these behaviors um, and that are able to communicate them immediately if they see something, say something. Um, making sure we develop really strong risk management options, um, creating and promoting safe school climates, and then making sure that we provide the necessary training for all the stakeholders. So we are in the process of creating a crisis prevention team at the district level, which is going to fit these criteria. Um, we will be a part of this process. There is a, we're going to be getting some more information uh, in the near future after the holidays on what the next steps are. Um, but we indicated we are very much interested in being a part of this process and how we can um, share our best practices but also learn from other stakeholders as well at the state level on how we can improve what we're doing. So that's, that's an update on that workshop. I felt it was important to share that um, information. Thank you. <clears throat> Okay, I guess I have two things. One thing, I want to thank the Reading Education Foundation for doing an amazing job with the Festival of Trees again. What a beautiful, beautiful event it was. Um, and um, we were able to have a tree, a picture. Uh, well, it wasn't a tree, actually. A uh, snow folk um, exhibit talking about um, the power of when individual and beautiful snowflakes come together to form a powerful collaboration together, very different. Um, so there was, um, they've added evening events and um, it just was an amazing, thank you to everybody that went and thank you to all the organizers. It's a feat of love to do that. Um, and my second report uh, is um, the RACASA. It's a momentous time for the Reading Coalition Against Substance Abuse. It is now morphed. It is now the Reading Coalition for Prevention and Support. And that is because it is moving more towards prevention and support, um, a positive goal. Um, it will continue to collaborate. It will now have a board of advisors similar to what it has had from across the town, the people in, um, positions, whether they're elected or volunteer, will be part of the advisory group. The second part eventually will be a Friends of Reading um, Coalition for Prevention and Support. It's a mouthful. They're going to be going by the Reading Coalition for now, as opposed to RACASA. Um, and they're going to be focusing on exchanging and sharing information that will enhance our community's approach to substance abuse prevention and mental health promotion. Um, and it will be, they'll be engaging the schools as they have been. Um, it's no longer going to be a grant funded organization, but now it will be actually under our town. We own it and our town is very supportive of it. Um, Okay, and then just a snapshot, because I can't go into everything they're doing, um, but it actually, um, 
it relates very well to what Dr. Darty was just talking about in terms of reaching kids before the problems start, making connections. There are diversion programs, our new outreach coordinator, Sammy Selkin, has been busy meeting kids and working with the school nurse on ESPERT and going with the school resource officer to the middle schools to teach about vaping. They've been going through training. Sammy is now collecting a lot of um, a, a lot of um, training, so she's now qualified to do a lot of different things. And um, let's see, so they're not only working with people in town, they're also working with the Middlesex League and not the Sports League, but um, the, the groups that are working on mental health and substance abuse um, to figure out best practices and they're being featured to speak at places where they're sharing our best practices because we have a lot to be proud of in our Reading Coalition Against Substance Abuse, now the prevention and support. Um, I guess that it doesn't cover it all, but that's just a, a snapshot of everything they're involved in. Is there a change in the governance structure of it? Is it yes. Still Erica and, and so well, our CASA, as we know it, has been dissolved. Um, so in that structure, we no longer can use because uh, the grant is now ended. So it's under the police department, and Eric is the executive director. Uh, her role, her title has changed, um, and Sammy is the outreach coordinator. Um, and then there's this advisory board now, which is essentially what is the old, the old, board. the old board. But there is, it no longer has any um, decision-making responsibilities. It, its sole purpose is to advise um, the coalition. No reports. date first. So Mrs. Aller. <laughs> Thank you. Um, good evening everyone. Um, so I do have the first quarter uh, personnel report for you tonight. Uh, I, what I think is going to be probably most effective is for me to, which I've kind of done in the past, um, walk through the report, um, which hopefully might help to answer any questions you have about it. And then obviously after that, um, once we're finished, I'm happy to go back through and answer anything additional. Um, so to start, this is for the first quarter, which you'll see in that first paragraph does outline um, the dates of the report, which is July 1st of 2019 through this past uh, December 9th. We, um, in that time frame, we hired 69 new, what we consider, and what I guess we term for this purpose to be professional employees, so we do give a little definition of that in that second paragraph. So we're including here teachers, administrators, our paraeducators, custodial workers, and our um, secretarial staff. Um, so again, just to clarify, that's not inclusive of any sort of cafeteria workers, daily subs, any sort of um, seasonal temporary based positions are not included uh, in this report. What the first little key there shows you um, is something that we've had consistent in a couple of the reports now, which is all of our positions um, for the sake of this report, we convert into uh, what we call FCFTEs, um, which typically has been used to represent teachers. So for example, a, a 1.0 FTE would be a full-time teacher. Um, but we do have our paraeducators, some other staff, um, secretary, our custodial staff, who we typically look at on a bi-weekly type basis um, as hourly employees, but for the sake of this, um, those positions have been converted into FTEs using that table. So it, it will outline for you what that would mean for you know a secretary who's a 1.0, that means they're a secretary that works 75 hours bi-weekly. So tables one through nine, what these are is we've gone through and outlined um, all of our newly hired, so these are newly hired staff that have come out, that um, have come in completely new to the district um, and into positions that have been posted uh, throughout the time period of the first quarter. 
So they do, they are organized by school. So you'll see the first table, Barrows. Um, and again, they're on the bottom of each uh, table. I do total up the FTEs, again, per school or per, uh, per department. So feel free to take a look through those. Um, and again, we can always bounce back if you have some specific questions within the tables. Um, what we have done after table nine um, is we've taken, so all of those tables, one through nine, um, in our next table, what we've done is brought those all together to show you all of those positions from above that we filled, which ones of those were budgeted. So this table represents all of those in which were budgeted for um, for that quarter. So we, we anticipated that um, those positions to have existed and then were vacant and then we filled. Um, the following table, um, which you should actually just see one um, entry there on that table is for all of uh, the positions, in this case the one position in which um, we, we did not anticipate. So this was an increase. Um, so those are separated out for you to see. Um, what we did a little different this year that we haven't done in previous reports, um, but in taking a look back at some of the previous, we thought it might be beneficial to highlight this out. Uh, previously, what we were mainly doing is basing the report off of our newly hired employees. What we weren't really reflecting um, was some of the shifts that were still going on, but we didn't bring anyone new to fill in. They, there may have been vacancies, but what we consider these are, tr are essentially transfers, um, so things that are happening internally. So. A, a daily sub who may become a paraeducator, a para who may become a teacher, but again, all internal staff who make those moves. Um, so in total, uh, we had 47 um, staff members make transfers within the district uh, to various from one position to another. What we did find might be important is to just highlight out of those 47, which one of those uh, transfers did include some um, increases in staffing that were not budgeted for. So that table highlights out the position in which an internal person was, was moved into, um, but also subsequently had a, an increase uh, that was not budgeted for. So we thought it would be important to highlight that out to kind of give a, a bigger picture as to what, um, what was going on in terms of staffing and filling positions. Um, we do, as always, highlight out our open requisitions, so our open job requisitions. Um, so we don't have, um, happy to say we don't have any open teacher positions at this point, which is always a good thing for this time of year. Um, but we, what you will see is um, two of those positions are italicized, and there is a little note there that we've actually made offers for those positions, so technically we're considering them open because we've not officially brought someone in, but the, um, I have made offers for those, and they've been accepted, so we're anticipating them to be filled, so just to get a, a more clear picture as to what's actually open. Um, and then... Again, as always, we will, uh, our, our following table after that, we'll highlight out um, specifically for our teachers. So this is for teacher separations. So we have broken down, we had a total of, um, in this quarter, uh, 30 teachers um, who have separated from the district. And we've highlighted out um, within that table the reasons um, for those separations. And you'll see below that there's also another key to kind of help you give an, an idea because really that the table above just kind of uses one or two words to explain why. But we wanted to give you a little broader look into why, you know, what those terms actually mean. Um, so that is just a little run through to the format. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions or clarify anything for anyone. Mr. Wise. Yep. First of all, thank you. It's great to see the detail, um, and it's great to see that of all of the changes, we've only gone up by 1.35 FTE across the board, so doing a quick little math. Um, I do have one question, and maybe Dr. Stice needs to answer, maybe you need to answer. Sure. Um, the three special education positions, those appear to be like they were budgeted, um, and two of them are at one school, um, so I'm wondering if we have any 
concerns or exposure to existing IEPs because those two positions weren't filled earlier. And we're now September, October, November, December, four months into a school year, and what we're doing to remediate that, if anything. So you're referring to the open job yes. requisitions? Yes, table 14. Thank you yep. for the clarification. So, um, so any place we've been um, filling in and we've notified people if there was an issue with compensatory services and we're working on that. Um, and we, we did some creative um, service delivery as well. So we have, um, for example, two students that are receiving tutoring after school to compensatorily um, make sure that what's in their IEP is being fulfilled. So we were very creative and have also reached out to anyone that we owe compensatory services to with a plan to remediate that. Quick follow-up then. I love it. First of all, thank you for making sure we're closing all those gaps. After school tutoring, I'm expecting that's kind of unbudgeted. Is that in here somewhere or is it covered in some other way, shape, or form? Well, the positions I, you were talking about were paraeducators. One's a, right? Yeah, they're both paras. So. Both yeah. Paras. So typically, we don't, ones I mean, center. as Jennifer said, the principals have been working carefully to, like, you know, get subs and move people yeah. around. It's not you, these particular ones. I mean, I'm familiar with both, okay. with these. Um, I don't believe any <laughs> tut tutoring is taking place in those particular positions, right, Jen? With right. The no, not with those yeah. two. Just overall. Right. Yeah, okay. and oftentimes in these positions, we'll look to increase hours of other paraeducators as well. So yeah. even though the yeah. position may be open, we have a whole yeah. <laughs> process and yeah. we have to right. move the yeah. para, backfill the para. So we have, it's a, it's a little bit yeah. of a domino. Yeah. These look open, but they've probably been filled most days. Yeah. Have a quick, on, on yeah. that chart, Jen, Maybe I'm not trying to create more work, but maybe uh, I'd be interested going forward, kind of know when that, how long that's been, because I know when the- How long the position's had, been open? We've had- Sure, yeah. Like that situation with the reading teacher mm -hmm. or just- Sure, so yeah, no, that's something we can definitely do, yeah. If the school committee needs to provide more resources or something, at least we're, it's on our radar screen. Sure, yep, uh, absolutely. The other, uh, just, Sorry, Jean. Just mm -hmm. one other quick thing is I'm looking at the reasons for resignation. What, yes. What, what would fall under the category? I see we lost four people for lifestyle. What would fall under that? <laughs> yeah, so, um, so typically, um, and if you do look down at the chart, we do kind of highlight out uh, the table below that does give a little bit of a definition. Oftentimes, we have teachers, yeah, um, who will report that it's typically family-based, so they're either childcare-based or spending more time with family or <coughs> some sort of something in their personal life and family that's caused for them to need to take a step back from, you, from work, so yes. You don't need, I, I, I missed that. Oh, that's okay. Jean? Just a quick question on table 12. Yes. So it looks like the only position that wasn't originally budgeted for FY20 is a .43 special education program paraeducator. It's sort of like Mr. Robinson just said. Don't know if I should address this to you or to Dr. Styes or to Ms. Dowd. <laughs> so, um, but I guess my question is, is this particular position being driven by an individual IEP or is it more programmatic? Um, typically by a student need. Okay. Um, typically, I would say more often than not when we're increasing it's for that purpose. So yes, um, is it correct to say it was an unforeseen need? Yes. 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 Okay. Yeah. And, thank you. and we have a pretty thorough, I'll jump <laughs> in for, she'll kick me if I'm wrong. We actually have a full vetting process where it, it typically takes several meetings and iterations yep. meeting with the principal. Jen and I will go and talk to them and really look at what the need is. Is it temporary? Is it permanent? So we take each one individually and assess it and vet it out. Yeah, and which rolls back to what's the need, how do we make sure that every student is covered in a way that's thoughtful. Thank you. Jen, first of all, thank you. What do you see as the biggest challenge in filling these roles right now? So I would, currently two of our open requisitions are actually, um, the are out. what was that? The offers are out. 
So. Yes. Um, and one of them being um, the accounting assistant, which just isn't, mm -hmm. that's not one we've often filled ever, um, honestly, in a very long time. We had um, someone great working with us for a very long time. Um, so I think we're just being, we've had a number of applicants, um, you know, Gail um, and Chris and, you know, and Gail's been keeping kind of in contact with me about the status of that, have gone through a number. Um, I think what's important is we want to make sure for that one specifically we're, we're making an appropriate hire. Um, so we've been vetting through a lot um, and we're actually looking to kind of rework uh, the job description which Gail and I touched base on um, yesterday. And so hopefully we're hoping to kind of refresh that. So honestly that to me is a bit of an outlier, um, similar with the payroll and personnel assistant, um, which kind of is just opened pretty, we just actually closed, so we're hoping to interview um, the week after the holidays, roughly. So to me, I'm not concerned really about those two. When you're looking at the paraeducator positions in a regular education tutor, which is also a paraeducator, it's in the paraeducator union, it's not uncommon for us to see those positions um, throughout even throughout the year open up a lot of times what happens is those paras may find teaching positions or where or they're even finding own positions within our district and making some shifts which is why they open up um and obviously it, it is kind of the, the climate of our um the workforce right now it's it's been a little difficult i think finding um, applicants in those pools, but it's just, it's not uncommon. Um, I'm not overly concerned when I see paraeducator positions open up through the year. Um, and again, it's good to see that, you know, two of those we've made offers on and, and we're hoping to have them start after the holiday. So um, does that help to answer that? Absolutely. Dr. Um, first of all, thank you yeah. very much. I loved, um, I remember when you started, <laughs> And I loved how you presented in the beginning and asked us so politely to wait with our questions rather than interrupting you right away. I thought that was, um, I loved it. Anyways, um, I also really appreciate your talking about the transfers within the district yes, yeah. because that, that's a message yeah. for choosing to stay yeah. here um, and look for jobs that f fill them um, here. Yeah. So I really appreciated that. Um, my question is, and it might not be answerable because I realize not everybody does exit interviews, sure. et cetera, but um, we had a big change in the high school with the delayed, with the delayed start. And I yes. was wondering if you heard of anyone in particular, you don't tell me who. I know, I know that. But if there were any reports. Um, there was not, actually. Not there was not. Okay. Yeah, I just, happy to report that, yeah. Thank you. That was my question. Thanks. Doctor. Switch out. <laughs> Excuse me, I don't no, want to bump back. you out. I, I had this similar question to uh, Dr. Doxer about the, so I'm, I'm happy to hear that there were yeah. no uh, that left. There were a couple of, I guess, maybe typos. It looked like there's no table 10. Yes, the chart. I know. I talked to Linda about that right before we got up here. So I think nine. we did a little reformat, and I think the numbers got yeah. mixed up. Okay. The other um, question I, think I had. I just missed, so I apologize for that. Was in table 11, I was sort of startled to see that we, we lost our special education director in FY20. But I, I guess it's the title says vacancies that occurred in FY20, but it also lists those that were, I would have said, vacated at the end of FY19, that, oh, you know, I at see, the yeah, end of the June, point, right? Yeah. So maybe it could break that up to, um, you know, those that ended at the la end of the last versus those that actually opened up after July 1st. Sure. I can explain. So um, the reason why I think it's, it's worded in that way is that we're basing it off of new hires. So technically we're showing you that's the person who filled that position, um, who started in this. But I do see your, I absolutely see your point in that it was a, we were made aware of the vacancy, correct, prior to FY20, um, and then subsequently, correct, correct. So yes, absolutely. Yeah, I get that. It's a valid point. Thank you for that. Thank you. Yeah, thank you guys. This is Dowd. Great. Thank, thank you. you. So similar to what we have done in the past, we have the first quarter financial update. So this is based upon um, actual data through December 13th, which I'm not sure running it on Friday the 13th was. <laughs> <laughs> not an omen, that just was the date that 
so lucky. I ran it. And then what I do is working with all of the various cost centers, um, a lot of time with the central office staff we go through, as well as with, with Jen looking at payroll projections, where we are in terms of staffing, substitutes, people on leaves, coming back from leaves to make sure we've captured everyone. A lot of time on special ed with my friend Chris in the back can attest to where we're going student by student, looking at transportation, out of district placements. Um, again, I do caution it's a little bit early in the year, even though we feel like it's in December. We pretty much at this point have two solid months worth of information. We're still getting November invoices. Um, so I will say we are about where I would anticipate us to be at this time of the year, and we are continuing to track it. This is typically the projection we then use when we're building next year's budget, so we'll get into sort of that process after. But it sort of gives everyone a good indication of how early we're trying to prepare next year's budget based upon two months of information in the current year. A couple of items that we do have reflected in here that we have talked about um, Jen did mention we do have an open position within the central office, which is the HR payroll assistant, which is getting added next year as a community priority. Based upon the workload and where we are, we are actively recruiting on the position now, which we had talked about earlier in the year. And coupled with that, the reason we felt it was very important to start bringing staff in is our payroll HR person is currently out on leave, so we currently have no payroll person. Um, so we were able to backfill that position. We were very fortunate we found somebody um, who had just great. retired and we brought her in. So we are sort of dual paying that position now, but it has highlighted to us, especially within central office, that we basically have one person per position. So when people do go out, um, I do have to applaud Chris sitting out in the back because he has been dual hatting for our accounting <laughs> position that we had an unforeseen retirement. So we are now sort of all pinch hitting because we don't have multiple people in the position. So one of the items we are asking for is for school committee to approve a transfer of $35,000 into the administration cost center to cover these two positions and I know I often get asked it looks as if we have a $30,000 deficit that's based upon what I know today so I always like to the accountant in me I always round up because I do not know definitively when my payroll person will be coming back if she goes out later or we're able to hire the new position earlier so rather than keep coming back I I feel it's safer to ask for a little bit more and then if we don't need it we can transfer it back um, and then throughout the year, we will continue to review all of our revolving funds and offsets as we go through. So typically, if there are any adjustments to those, we would assess those later in the year. But based upon looking at balances now, we're comfortable with where we are with those. Yes. And I just want to clarify, the only motion you're requesting is a $35,000 transfer to the administration cost center from the regular day. Correct. Before yes. I read the motion. <laughs> yes. okay. uh, I move to transfer $35,000 to the administration cost center from the regular day cost center, utilizing salary savings from staff turnover, unfilled positions, and staff extending leaves of absence in the regular education cost center. Mm -hmm. Second. All right, any discussions? All those in favor? Six zero. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> and I'll breathe a sigh. <laughs> <laughs> so, Dr. Doherty, are you going to do the budget overview, or is I that? I think we got surplus. Now? I have next. one more. Oh, other. the surplus. Sorry. sorry, I sort of. Um, what we have done typically in the <coughs> past, we had done one surplus request per year we would like to move to doing this twice a year the rationale behind that is over the summer we do a lot of work with the technology with teacher moves we have the fire inspections come through so we end up with a lot of items that potentially can be surplus the issue we run into is we do not have a lot of space so we create other issues by keeping all of this in hallways and boiler rooms which people don't like me to do 
Um, <laughs> so we are requesting the list that's in here be declared as surplus, and I do want to let people know that we do take this very seriously. We look at all of the items, anything that can be repaired, salvaged, we do go that route. If we get to the point where it's more costly to start repairing items, we look to dispose of it. We do utilize resources that will come and get the equipment for a lot of the books and curriculum type items. Most of these items are not in really good shape. They're missing pages. They might be not in great shape. We do work with other organizations that can donate them to other uses if they are something that can be. So we're not just necessarily tossing items. We do a very thorough review of it before doing that. But a lot of these items, it, it's hard to reuse books that are missing pages and stuff like that. So we do go through a very methodical process <coughs> to do this. Um, Move to declare the items listed in the Chief Financial Officer's Memorandum dated December 16, 2019 as surplus property. Second. Second. Questions or discussion? Maybe the principals will be very happy. <laughs> <laughs> Get happy the space back. <laughs> that, that'll be my holiday gift to the principals tomorrow. <laughs> Mrs. Dowd will be taking the lead on this. Okay. <laughs> so what... The process we started, I want to say the last year or the year, it might have been last year, is we're going to do a very high level budget overview process at this point. And to sort of level set, this is much more, I'm going to say, an introductory. There is no financial aspect to this. What we want to do is just level set so that when January hits, which is the part I enjoy, we're all into the numbers and not necessarily the how we're organized, how we're structured, and how the process works. It really allows us to focus January on the budget numbers themselves. So a lot of this, again, will be similar to those who might have participated in this last year, but we felt it was an important part to sort of level set how we get here. So I can do it one of two ways. I can kind of go through it all if people want that or if there are questions along the way, I can do either or. So if I'm not looking, feel free to throw something at me. We can, I mean, Just don't I don't think it, me. as long as it doesn't get out of hand, we can okay. through the process ask questions. Okay. So what we're going to do is go through the budget structure, the process, various methods we use for communication quick calendar of events just to remind folks the lay of the land of how we're doing it and then questions. So we just want to remind folks that there are several sources of funds for the schools. The operating budget itself, so that is the part when we go through and meet with finance committee and we get allocated our funds. That funds the salaries, materials, supplies, professional development, everything it takes to run on a day-to-day -day basis. The revenue sources come from property taxes, state aid, excise tax, fees, and any potential sales of land that the town does. Just as a quick reminder, we've left this in here even though we're sort of a little bit past the override, but as a reminder, property taxes can only increase by the 2.5% per year unless there is um, an override. And another part that we do get asked quite a bit is that at the end of the year, any unspent or unencumbered funds do go back to the town into free cash. We're not allowed to use last year's money for this year. The only exception is we are allowed to prepay out of district tuition three months worth per yeah. student. That is really the only exception towards that. The capital side of it, um, that is currently targeted at about 5% of the revenues available to the town. These tend to be much more larger scale improvement projects, so a lot of the roof work that we do, probably the ones most familiar for us were the turf replacement from last year when the modulars got approved. So they tend to be much more one-time significant events, typically having a longer life than it regular daily operating item. A couple of items that are, are ongoing that we've talked a lot about are the security study and the performance management contracting, which will be 
discussed probably more in the upcoming months are some of the larger capital items. We cannot use capital funds to support the operating budget, so we are not allowed to move funds between the two items without having town meeting approval. So once the budget is set, I can't tap into my capital allocation for operating funds. We do have other sources of funds that we have. We have grants and revolving accounts. The revolving accounts are those accounts that are generated from user fees, so think kindergarten, rise, athletics, um, extracurricular. We also, within those revolving accounts, can have ticket sales, so football games and items such like that where we share in some of the gate receipts. We also have donations that come in from folks, and then we also have federal and state grants <coughs> as well. For all of these instances, they have to be utilized for the purpose in which the funds were derived. So similar to I can't use capital for operating, I can't use revenue <coughs> from a, you know, federal grant for other purposes, or I can't use athletic donations for full day kindergarten. So you have to follow all of the rules and requirements. Quick reminder for folks as well that might be new to the process. The way that the school system is set up is we have five distinct cost centers that we budget and present, which mirrors what was in the memos that I do for you each quarter. So it's the administration, regular day, special education, district-wide programs are the four relatively smaller items we have up there, athletics, extracurricular, health services, which is the nursing side of things, and then networking and technology. And then what we have going through the school department is the school custodians. You'll see when we present in January that the facilities is really made up of three components. The core, which is a lot of the heavy maintenance, the lights, heat, the town custodians, and the school custodians. So the school department reviews and approves each individual cost center once the school committee has approved the budget, as you saw in the memo, I cannot move money between the cost centers without pre-approval from school committee. When it goes to town meeting, town meeting members vote one bottom line. So they do not approve each individual cost center. That is the school committee's purview. We get to ask that question a lot, why it's presented at just one number at town meeting. So we thought it was helpful for now just to kind of go through high level what each cost center is. Again, it sort of takes it out of the January time frame. So administration, I like to say we're the most important, but we are the smallest cost center. <laughs> um, so that includes all of the central office staffing and personnel, all of the legal and accounting. So for legal, this is the personnel side of the legal. The student services piece is within special education. So we have two legal buckets. Um, Oh, I was going to point to Jen, but she left. All of the employee recruiting and hiring goes through here. We do have um, data and information management. So um, Lori Miller, who helps us, she sits in central office, does a lot of that work. Um, the district telecommunication services. We do, per the teacher's contract, have a tax annuity, tax sheltered annuity contribution that we make. That is within our cost center as well as well as any of our professional development and memberships go through there and then postage supplies and expenses go through our cost center. Regular day, that is the largest cost center. That is where the bulk of all of our expenses are. That includes all of the building administrators and secretaries, so all the building principals, all of their secretaries, the reg ed teachers, tutors, paraprofessionals go through there, the school psychologists, guidance counselors, ELL is part of regular day, instructional specialist, which that's the curriculum coordinators, Courtney Fogarty's, the data coach is part of this group as well. A lot of our stipends for the teacher mentors, the leadership stipends, a lot of the various stipends we pay for building-based activities go through here. Curriculum materials, PD, substitutes, our mandatory transportation 
is within this cost center as well. And basically everything it takes to run the day-to-day -day of the schools is within this cost center. We have the special education cost center. So very similar, it has the special education administrator. So this is where Jen Stice, the team leader, the team chairs, mm -hmm. I always say them wrong, are in there. Um, the special education teachers, the special ed para educators are through here. Any of the specialists that we have, the ESY program that we run in the summer, all of the expenses, the teachers and any other expenses go through here. The legal services we talked about. And anything that is directly tied to providing the services. So if we have consultative, evaluative services, various technologies that are directly tied to the special education services, so not a regular laptop that every student would have. It's, very, it's the specialized equipment, testing and assessment software. We also have all of the special education, transportation, and out-of-district tuition runs through here as well. The district-wide programs, those are the four smaller cost centers that we talked about. So athletics, what gets a little tricky is you'll see points of people. It is one person who I divide their salaries among many areas, and this is all based upon the DESE requirements. So this would be Tom Zayer is actually split three ways. So he is partly athletics, he's partly high school principal, he's partly extracurricular. So it's one person, I split their salaries based upon DESE requirements. Because um, oftentimes we get asked, I don't have fractions of people running around, <laughs> I'm splitting their salaries behind the scenes. So within their athletics, we have basically the costs of running the program, the officials, the coaches, the equipment, field maintenance. We do have the athletics revolving account where the fees go in. We take what's called an offset into this cost center to offset the cost mainly of the coaches and the program and any other items we can, we can assign closely related to the fees we bring in. Similar to extracurricular, very tiny cost center. Um, again, that's Tom Zaya. And then we have the advisor stipends and then any minimal transportation fees, memberships, royalties that go through there. Tom, yeah. quick question, yeah. hopefully. Uniforms. Do those come through the revolving account or are they budgeted here in this they space? typically would be budgeted here within the athletics. So things like band uniforms, football uniforms, yep. soccer uniforms, all are budgeted here? Yep. The band would be yeah, extracurricular, extra yeah. football, athletics, those would be within the athletics one. So we can look to whether we're bringing in enough user fees to help offset the cost of the uniforms, those tend to be pretty significant dollar amounts, whereas on the band side, we, we, we have don't have enough funding within the revolving account to pay for it, oh. <clears throat> if that answers. Also within the district-wide program is health services, which I will is the director of nursing, and even though each of the schools has nurses assigned to it, all of those costs are captured here. And again, this is a DESE requirement when we do our reporting. Um, network and technology infrastructure, so for those that have been here in the past, I'll say Andy's part of this cost center. Um, <laughs> Julian Carr goes through there, so that is the technicians, our internet software licensing, we do now, this year we took over the clocks and bells that used to be part of the facilities department, but it's more closely related to the schools, so we took that over this year. Um, the networking infrastructure, the equipment and ongoing license and maintenance goes through this cost center as well. So this is the cost center we sometimes see ebbs and flows based upon our three-year renewal cycles and when those are coming due. The school custodians, so while this does report directly up through the schools, this is the group that reports up through Joe Huggins when he does his presentation. So this is, we do have a custodial manager. We have the custodians through there. We do have a courier. That is a huge help for us, bringing all the stuff back and forth between all of the schools. It covers their 
equipment and supplies, all of the radios we have for the district, they support that. And then we do have the cleaning contract here and at Coolidge Middle School. There are various items that are not directly covered within the budget, and these are oftentimes funded either by grants, donations, user fees, or other sources um, that we may have. And oftentimes those are field trip expenses, the additional technology hardware. We're very fortunate that oftentimes we do get great donations from the various PTOs to help add to, I'm going to say these wrong, the various cows and different types of I, I, you did it right. Yeah. Cows and calves. <laughs> cows and cows in the classrooms. Um, so we're very fortunate that we, we have a lot of funding that comes in for us. A lot of our iPads um, that at the elementary schools have been funded through that. Um, Non-mandatory student transportation, so we charge a fee for the buses. So that's how those buses um, get paid for. The before and after school programs are fee-based. Various enrichment programs that happen at a lot of our elementary schools tend to be fee-based. Um, Tom might have a question. Okay. So these are not in the budget, so we're not going to review these items in January. We are not. So when do we review revolving accounts, ins and outs, people, costs? Say, for example, yep. kindergarten, we are the third, if not the highest, cost for full-day kindergarten in the entire state. When do we look at that to see if there's a balance that we need to do? So the revolving accounts we do include, so I probably didn't answer it 100% correctly. So the revolving accounts we do review as part of the budget process. And if we are going to be making any proposed changes to fees or offsets, that is part of the budget process. What we don't necessarily do is get into, we do put charts in there about donations and high level what we've used them for, but that's not something I can when I say it's not part of the budget, I can't budget for future donations. I do budget for offsets in the revolving account. So those are part of the budget process. We will have charts on those. We will look at where the balances are, what our plans are, and the process we go through to review the fees we're charging. Is that helpful? I think so. We'll wait to see it in January, and then I'll have more questions potentially. <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome. What we also do, the way we have handled the grants historically is this is the time of year when most of the, especially the entitlement grants, the amounts have come out. We know what the amounts are. We present them as part of this. We discuss them again in January as part of the budget process and then throughout the year to the extent there are any adjustments. We typically bring those forth as part of the quarterly budget process. The, the way these have worked has changed slightly in that, in my three years here, the first year when you received your entitlement grants, especially those were pretty much known numbers. What's happened now is that the way a lot of these grants are working is the federal gives us money to the states, the states give the money to the school, and everyone holds a little piece back <coughs> until they know what the final budgets are. So oftentimes we will receive amendments throughout the year where we may get additional money in or we have we've been fortunate we haven't had reductions and sometimes it'll be you're going to get an additional sixty dollars in your title one grant where you actually have to yeah. apply for it and get it and file all the paperwork so that happens throughout the year and we'll report that back to folks as we do it the bulk of the grants have not changed um, we do have the MECO grant that we apply for each year, the circuit breaker reimbursement, which is ongoing. I will say that there's a lot of talk about changes to it. Mm -hmm. We still do not know the full impact of that. They are changing it. There is additional funding. There is circuit breaker related to transportation, which even as recently as last week, Desi is, they're still trying to figure out how it's going to work, what data they're going to need, how they're going to calculate it, how the reimbursement's going to work. So I actually do not have figures as to what our portion of that will be. I do know from conversations I've had, and I think Dr. Stice can agree that from what I'm understanding, the transportation side is going to be moving mountains to get that. Yes. The, the amount of detail they're going to want and whether or not districts actually are going to be set up the way 
they want you to be. This is it's it, it's great money to get, but it's not <laughs> free and easy money so to what, obtain. So what will we be building the budget with? Seventy percent or, or less. Right now, for the transportation side, where we actually have not built an, anything for ours for that. The, the interesting part is our tuition and transportation is actually part of the accommodated yeah. costs. And one of the good things we have been able to do as a district is we have basically a year banked. So we're actually using last, last year's circuit year breaker this year so we can budget mm -hmm. with fact certain. And then if they fund additionally, it helps us as opposed to trying to guess how they're going to fund it, budget based on that, and then have potential shortfalls. Mm -hmm. So this is an area that as more information comes out, we'll be working very closely with the town to see how it's going to work, what the calculations look like, so that we can set up the budget process better going forward. But right now, they haven't even said what the amounts are going to look like. And it's phased in, I think, it's next 20, year's it's 25%. 20 percent. 20, 25 percent, the next year's 40 percent, but they haven't said of yeah. what number yet or what the base is that you get reimbursed above. So, And the documentation that goes along with it is another whole piece that we yeah. Mm. yeah. So on that front, and I think he can't speak as a finance committee member, but we have one in the, in the forum and he's asking these questions generally is, um, is this something that is so much paperwork that it's worth it to invest from a resource perspective in order to get the return of the money coming back? Would it, sell, would it pay for itself and then some? Do we have any, any idea yet there, um, considering you're saying it's a mountain of paperwork? Yeah, I think for the tuition, it definitely it's is worth it. worth it. I think for transportation, I think eventually it will be given the numbers we're looking at. The right. challenge we're having is they haven't said whether or not you need I've heard anything from if you just have a bus contract, you're okay. Others are saying you may need an individual agreement per child, per route, per school, which it's also we have to get the vendors, DESE, the districts to all work together to figure out how do we actually execute this because that's not how transportation works. It's one agreement where you could have one bus going through four towns to get to one school. So we've been having a lot, there's been a lot of working groups and surveys just trying to figure out, and some people have in-house transportation, we outsource ours, so there's just, they actually have not even come out with what the formula and requirements look like. I will say we participate in the Medicaid reimbursement, and that's another area we've actually seen a lot of districts pull out of it, because the amount of effort it is taking to do the submissions, it's costing districts more to do it than they're getting back. So it, we are starting to see shifts in that. And, and they also changed some of the language in it so that now it's not just a disability, it's a medical disability. So lots of people are having anxiety over who's, who's licensed, under what piece. And actually, the state is running something for special education directors in January yeah. to get more guidance because I think across the state, there's a lot of angst and people feeling like, I'm not sure this is, one, worth our time, but two, are we putting people at risk? So that's something we're going to continue to look at and we'll report back to you on. But we keep seeing the emails of other districts saying, okay, it, we don't have the manpower that's required to do all of this for the minimal output. And we also were very aware of the impact it could potentially have on the town because even for us, the Medicaid, if we receive $150,000 worth of revenue, that's real, that's real money. money. So it's not a decision we take lightly, but right. we definitely are in the stage of saying, okay, at what point are we spending more? than we're actually receiving. So the circuit breaker for transportation, we we just I've, honestly don't have a lot of the information yet because it's so new. I mean, just as a side note, anything dealing with the Student Opportunity Act, we have heard nothing from DESI yet. Yeah. And, and that includes all of this new circuit breaker information. 
they are they're overwhelmed because they they have been required to get information out to the districts to start implementing all these things and we've heard nothing so so that's circuit breaker <laughs> um the federal entitlement grants those are all the same grants we have been receiving each year so no changes the ones at the bottom i will put down as com more competitive where you have to apply for them the early childhood special education improvement grant that is one we have been fortunate enough to receive each year <coughs> the other two at the bottom were new ones we actually did talk about last year during the budget process the improving student access to behavioral and mental health services that is one that we worked very closely with the high school on last year so we actually were approved for this last year but the funding did not start until this year so this is the first time we'll see funding but we actually applied for it and received it last year and then the screener pilot that is one um, that we talked about at the last meeting so just as a little bit of background we do spend we have been asked to try to explore every opportunity to get different types of funding we have a pretty thorough process we go through before we apply for any of the grants I will admit I'm the one that stops at I start it no <laughs> explain to me why we need it because what I always want to be cautious of are we taking on more than we can handle or are we committing to something that is a one-year grant that I then can't support going forward so I will say for all of these grants they do not have the competitive grants do not have staffing attached to them any type of dollars to staffing wise are more one-time sort of stipended type of positions where we're going to have teachers come in and work on curriculum a lot of them actually are mostly professional development as well um, I think the last competitive grant that we had that was FTE based was the school climate grant that was a five-year multi over a million dollars worth so that was one where we did have staffing but we had five years to come up with a plan on it so I do want to let the committee know that we take the grants each one individually goes through a very thorough vetting process before we would submit the other part that gets tricky is some of these come up and you have a very short window in which to submit your application so it's not even like you have months to kind of talk about it some of them come up and literally within a month you have to have your information there and then we look at all the procurement we look at all the requirements we look to see what's the reporting and then how do we make sure whatever we're doing we can then continue it okay. so similar to what we've done in the past we do show folks where we are from a funding standpoint as well as some of the changes um, some of the grants have been changing slightly I think the way that the government is doing them some of them they've started to combine some of the grants I know for we used to have two under the IDEA umbrella for the, the the large IDEA grant and then we used to have a professional development grant they did away with the professional development grant and kind of melded it into the regular IDEA grant so we've started to see sort of a collapsing of some of the umbrellas um, the biggest change we have on there is obviously the school climate grant ended its five-year stint um, in September of this year so we last year was really the first the last year of the funding on that one so we're doing all the wrap-up on that one now and then we do have a couple of the new ones down below which is the high school grant for the 63,000 and then the screener one and the screener one really is a one and done it's it's part of the pilot program that we thought was important to be part of and really it's it's interesting because we have the grant they funnel the money through us they pick the screener we pay the screener so it's sort of a literal <coughs> in and out of that um, and then the mental health one for the high school is a lot of professional development work and consulting work that's being done there are no there are no staffing on that one mr. Robinson yes I'm sorry. I I just want to remark on how amazing it is to me that you're handling your job you're all doing your regular jobs 
and you're doing this grant writing. When I started six years ago, I was very conscious of districts that had grant writers unto themselves. I don't know if they still do with the financial climate right now, but I know from having written small grants what it takes to get a small grant and then how to follow it up with the paperwork and all that stuff. And I just want to say thank you because I look at this list and I know with each one of these things there's a lot that needs to be done. And it's, it's not all taxes that we're based on, which is clear. And I, I just want to say a shout out um, to members of my team. I know um, Courtney, who's our data coach, who had done so much work on uh, the school climate grant, um, transformation grant. She worked uh, very closely on um, the grant that the high school had. Um, and then um, I know Allison and Heather are constantly, the curriculum coordinators are constantly looking at PD opportunities, either small ones um, like, you know, uh, STEM week, you know, a couple hundred dollars, even little things that can just bring more enriching activities to our staff and, and students. So, you know, really you said we're doing it without a grant writer, but really we have our in-house learning and teaching team and they're constantly scouring for things like that. Thank you. Anything else? So now we'll quickly walk through um, the budget process, some of which has already started. So as folks may be aware that this really starts in the August, September timeframe with us working very closely with the town manager. We have the financial forum in October each year. So at that point, we are looking at our projected accommodated costs, community priorities. We're looking at revenue sources. So there's a lot of upfront work, which is a little crazy when you think about it that we're starting that process in August in September before the school year really even starts that we're we're already looking at numbers for the following year so the way the process works is that we start with the total pool of revenue available subtract the accommodated costs subtract the capital and then any community priorities which we have been very fortunate this year that the priority is that the town has worked with us to fund the HR payroll position that used to be one position shared with the town and paid for by the town that we now will each have dedicated resources. Once we look at all of that, the remainder of the available resource is split between the town and the school and we're approximately 64% of that found funding, but we do work very collaboratively with the town manager on priorities, accommodated costs. We both try to get as much detail as you can that early in the year to, to build these numbers. And even throughout the process, we're having constant communications as things continue to shift. So again, the community priority is the funding of the HR payroll person, which we are, we're comfortable based upon what we've seen that the salary dollars will be sufficient. So these are the numbers that um, the town manager presented as part of the financial forum in October. So we are currently working on building up the budgets which we will be presenting in January based upon the funding that is available. And then as, when we go through the budget, we typically have what I'll call our kind of our guiding principles to make sure we're funding what we should be funding. Well, that's, that's and true. oftentimes that involves us. We're obviously, we're working together in central office with all the building principles, making sure what we're putting in the district improvement plans are what we're considering when we do this. And then we're also working very closely as part of the capital plan to look at items and, and timing of those as well. I won't go too crazy into, I mean, we spent a lot of time on the improvement plans. Um, and then what we also look at is any of our known funding commitments. So for me, it's always nice to be going into the budget season with settled contracts. So we are entering into the final year of all of our collective bargaining agreements so we do know what all of the salary scales are. And just as a quick reminder, we basically take kind of the population we have today and move them all forward on all of the various tables and schedules that we have 
we work very closely, <laughs> Jen and I, Kristen and Marie, on special education, where we're going through looking at our, all of our known out of district. Are there any students that we feel may be coming back, going out, students that are graduating? So we have spreadsheet upon spreadsheet of every single child, every single known, and we're going through and budgeting to the best of our ability. That information, um, we look, we work very close with Chris Kelly and her team on any of the updates that are coming up to make sure that we're, you know, prioritizing our funding appropriately. We are also, next year's gonna be a busy year. We're in the final year of our transportation contract, so we will be in year five of that. So again, what's nice is we have known bus rates. So it, from a budgeting standpoint, we're able to factor all of that in and then Julie and Carr and I have spent a lot of time going through all of our software and maintenance and building out schedules to the best of our ability to try to stagger as many as we can so we don't have all of our renewals happening at the same year. So we've been working through that. The tricky part becomes when we're doing capital projects to also remember when, because typically when we do the capital project, you bundle in the first two to three years of the maintenance in it, so then we're making sure we're scheduling those out as well. Mr. Wyson. You wouldn't mind switching back real quick. Um, curriculum. Mm -hmm. we, might have, we might have heard about Algebra 1 coming up for a discussion. Um, I think this might be the first time we're hearing about it. Um, and is that going to be separate and distinct from what's going on this year in yeah. middle school? And how do we then? So it's, it's similar and different. And I haven't actually mentioned it publicly. Um, so as we were mentioned with the seven, eight math curriculum work that we're doing, um, the Pearson model that we're using is phasing out. So we got that notice. Um, so now we're looking at other programs because they're not renewing it. We won't have the online features. We won't be able to order workbooks, all of that interesting things. Mm -hmm. So that was the project that we're working on this year. We fully uh, plan to buy whatever you know series tool that we're looking at by the end of this year. We also um, realized and heard that Pearson is no longer working with the Algebra 1 module that we use. Uh, same kind of deal. Some of it is flash related um, because flash is going away. A lot of programs are phasing out programs and then kind of rebundling them into a new, better model. So um, after the holidays, we will be putting a team together with middle school folks, um, as well as the high school um, chair, and I will be working with a team to look at Algebra One, but that will not be implemented until next year's budget, because we have to work on seven eight this year. Does it does it tie to Algebra Two? Does it tie to geometry? So it eventually, um, eventually it may. We're we're kind of doing one thing at another. I mean, obviously, when we do any of these curriculum renewals and, and, and realignments, we want to look at um, the vertical piece. I mean, right now, we're looking at 7-8, and we have some, as, as you know, since there was an update, we're down to a couple of <coughs> programs that we're looking at. Um, Algebra 1 is, because we have an urgent need, we're going to move forward on that. I would say we will then move beyond that. Um, so math probably will be a continuing feature, but I can't guarantee that right now. Whereas I know social studies, the money that we allocated in this year's budget is only gonna cover, I mean, we basically bought materials for um, sixth and seventh grade social studies. Um, some civics, we still have to do some more civics, and we have a team at the high school looking at ninth grade social studies for implementation next year. So that will be our first thing, then we'll look as that ninth grade cohort moves on, we'll look at 10th grade, then we'll look at 11th grade. So social studies like science that we did a couple of years ago will have to be done in increments because it's too costly to do in one. Um, and then foreign language kind of came up because some of the books that we're using are really outdated. Um, and so we're, we're gonna start really looking at that. Um, and, and frankly, that will probably not start until next summer. We just don't have the bandwidth. To, ask, yeah. that was be so we question. can have, the, this is supposed to be the 20,000 foot view. Yeah. Uh, we can get into these. Yeah, that's definitely the gonna, it's gonna be Those part of, big, it's gonna be part of the January discussion. Yeah, so for communication purposes, we do the 
budget bulletins in the weekly journey newsletter that goes out we'll do high level snapshots um, obviously school committee meetings <laughs> Sorry, pathways. Pass it's sorry. the same. It's the same. Pathways yeah. and journeys. It's exactly yes. the same. The journey. You don't see the journey, but it's the same. It's, it's essentially the, the same, same newsletter. One. <laughs> <laughs> when I, I get. <laughs> we have too many names, right? Yeah. <laughs> all the C's. It's like all Sean the C's. Sean did too much. Sean did newsletter. <laughs> the newsletters that go out to the public. <laughs> School committee meetings and then um, all of the information that we have is also posted on the web page as well so the budget book the presentations and all of that is out there mm -hmm. I said and will hopefully be posted on our district social media page yes it will be yeah oh, I'm skip right through that no just kidding <laughs> <laughs> and then calendar of events um, obviously, we started in October with the financial forum. On the for the town budgets, they wrapped up their budget meetings in December. Several of us attended those meetings as well. We have the kickoff meeting today, and then on January sixth, we will start the detail. So we will have the administration, district-wide, school facilities, and capital update. So as part of that, we similar to the way that the town did it with the select board meetings, we'll be discussing the capital as part of that. So we will be doing that the first night where we'll talk about updates on capital projects that have ended in the current year, changes to the FY20 capital plan as well as the FY21 proposed capital plan which again will not be finalized the capital is really subject to change as we go through this project and priority shift on the 16th we will present the regular day and special education cost centers we did that last year and we felt it worked really well because those two really do work in tandem and we felt it was helpful to go through yep both of them on the 23rd, we have the public hearing and questions. That is typically the night where we do show the revolving accounts and an update on the grants for anything that has happened. And then we have a, the following week, we have um, the vote. And then by town charter, the budget is due to the town manager by January 31st at the latest. So that is our sort of, it has to go to him by that day. Mr. Wise. I have one sort of gosh, really sensitive today, these mics. Uh, logistical question. Um, the town charter also calls for the public hearing and 14 days notice, and then the, the hearings, 14 days notice before we vote. I mean, so if you look at this, it's the 27th, so it has to be notified on the 13th. Um, we will have not reviewed the entire budget by that point in time. Um, so I'm wondering if we need to adjust the schedule a little bit to either vote on the 30th and notify after we finish our meet on the 16th or or if we're already going to receive all the materials and how do we provide feedback that is substantive to correspond correspond with the public hearing notification where we have to say changes that are in that public hearing notification I, I think it's tied into the when the book is released not when the school committee meetings occur if you look at that because we had this two years ago and we fixed it okay, it's so when it's when the actual book is released to the public the, the budget at, at least 14 days and so maybe there's an interpretation I'll just read it real quick if you don't mind at least 14 days before the meeting at which the school committee is to vote on its budget request the school committee shall cause to be published in local news medium a general summary of such budget request that's the budget book. that's the budget book which we do have coordinated that that'll be out yeah that'll be out in early January with okay. the notice in the paper oh yeah which yep. which is fine but I guess my question is and we've provided a lot of guidance so there's going to be whatever if we want to change things and if it's substantive and it may not be substantive is that possible 
given this related stuff? If there, it then says the summary shall indicate specifically any major variations from the current year's budget and the reasons for such variations and a notice stating the times and places where complete copies, et cetera. So if we were to make any variations over January 6th or January 16th that isn't in that public notice. You won't be making any, any changes until your final vote. Changes aren't made until the final vote night. Changes will be made by us. Yeah. Now. Right. Yeah. Uh, but, just back to the, your original question, though. I'm looking at the January 27th, and we got to count back 14 days from that to have the public hearing. Is that to, to post the public notice? No, right. to post it. To post. To post it. it. Yeah. Yeah. Which no, we 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 went through this two years ago. These dates match what's in. The bylaw. <laughs> I, I don't remember going through that, but it, uh, oh, two years ago uh, we do. We remember it. <laughs> I do too. Quorum <laughs> 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 might remember. I guess my I guess the whole point of my question really is we will not have had to provide we will not have been able to provide any feedback on what the budget book says prior to you publishing that public hearing, and maybe that's status quo that's what should be done but we will not have had any feedback in that budget book outside of some general direction right prior to posting that public hearing so variance major variance that we might suggest would not be possible as part of that public posting okay. yeah it's not your budget yet Yes. Yeah, I just want to echo what Mr. Coram said. The way I understand Mass General Law is the superintendent is required to present the school committee a proposed budget. Correct. That's actually part of the legal requirement. It's in the law, correct. So I guess I wouldn't know a way to, to do it differently and still be within the law. I guess I was viewing it as two steps, and maybe that's incorrect, or maybe there's that step, as Dr. Doherty is saying, is the final vote was here's the recommended budget, here's any changes the school committee decides to put to it, the school committee's budget is then the one that we're publicly notifying of, right? That's, no. that's right, what I was so, doing. No, no, so this, no, what we're gonna, this is what we're going to do. I'll reconvene with the superintendent to make sure all the dates are right, and we'll, I don't want to go on about yeah, right. this. Yeah. For, that's fair. I'm sure they are, just, just to make sure. Yeah. No other oh, questions. Speaking of questions. Okay. Now we'll go back to the out. second reading of the social media. <laughs> yes. Move to accept the second reading and approval of policy BHE social media. So uh, the only change, we actually, I made two changes. One is uh, you can see that the last, and this was at the recommendation of Ms. Borowski the last time, so I changed, I, I eliminated that last sentence in the first paragraph. Yeah. I also eliminated SM at, after BHE because there is no such thing as BHE-SM. I was going to ask that question. That's not the code that's used when you're identifying the different policies. Other than that, it, it is the same exact policy. Mr. Wise. Um, so I think if we're going to eliminate SM, which I'm not opposed to, we need to come up with something besides BHE because I think we already have a BHE. No, this is replacing BHE. It was not the intent, necessarily. The BHE is the electronic communications policy, which covers things like email and things like that. This was an addition to that, which was to be specific around social media communication. So we checked with MASC. You, you, you can't just add uh, letters after policies um, with the coding system. This policy. My understanding was meant to replace BHE. 
that's the way I was explained to me from when I first got involved with this. And we had uh, BHE in the last packet. The last packet was the old BHE, correct. Yep. So my intent oh, the when, I, when I wrote this was not to replace BHE because that covers things like email and other things like that, which this media pol this policy does not cover, but was to add one specific to how we execute social media related communication. Um, and if we need to change the name or BH, I don't know, F, I, don't, I, I can double check to see if that exists or not, but that's why. No, you, you, we're not allowed just to add letters. <laughs> There's a certain system. That, that's what I was trying to explain. And when we did our research, I don't believe there is, Linda, no SM. there is no SM. Well, there are other cases in our policies, in particular bowling and a few others, where we have letters that don't align with MASC standard ones, right? Those They're, are the procedures, which are not actually supposed to be even in the policy book. Those are procedures. They're not the actual policy. Okay. But even so, what prevents us cre from creating our own policy? We're not bound to only MASC policies. In fact, many of our policies don't directly align with MASC policies. What prevents us from creating our own policy with our own file number? Is there anything that legally prevents us from doing that? The system that, my understanding again, the system that is used is we need to follow the numerical system that has been put out. It's, it, and it's not just MASC. That's, that's how all of Massachusetts you, does their, their school committee policies is through that, syst that different coding system. So I just pulled up BHE, and I actually hear Mr. Wise's point that <coughs> this is about things like yeah. email, and, and this proposed BHE shouldn't replace this because we would lose some important policy. I don't know what the answer is. I don't know what the solution is, but I think you bring up a valid point. I don't think this should replace BHE. Neither do I want to start adding letters to this. If it puts us out of compliance with MASC recommendations, I don't know if there's a way we can approve the substance of this and take the lettering of it as I don't know if it were possible to vote this if there was consensus and we want to move forward and then just leave the lettering and numbering as a something for the chair and the superintendent to work out with legal counsel and MASC I'd be inclined to do that mm -hmm. but if we can't do that I agree I don't think we can replace BHE with this my guess is what you can do is you can just add this to BHE. That's what, I, yeah. which, which is the same as adding an SM to it, right? Uh, no, no, do you just make it part of the current BHE? I got you. Yeah. Oh, instead of having like <coughs> BHE <coughs> slash. You're extending it. Right. That, that's fine. I mean, I, I can check, but I'm pretty sure that's you fine. can add this to BHE. Just because the scope of. of electronic Correct. has changed and it needs to be broader than what was in the original BHE. Yeah, so I, I'm just a really quick scan of BHE. This is really only two short paragraphs with some definitions. I, I would agree with that. I think we can just put it at the end of the policy. If there's no objection, I think that would work. I apologize. I was under the assumption you were replacing BHE with this. That was my impression from when I first became involved in this. That, that's not what was told to Colby, yeah, but, you know, yeah. Yeah, unfortunately, I entered this midstream, so that's why. <laughs> happens. Communication challenges, we fix it. I don't, I mean, I don't know that this directly as it is would fit right in at the end, necessarily. I think it would need to be adjusted to do to, to align and, and adjust BHE as it is. I mean, I think it's there's already some other. I think I think would be that would be too complicated to, to do in such short order. Um, well, from this discussion, the question I asked at the end of the meeting last the end of this discussion is that we don't have to finish this discussion nope. and vote today. We can continue our discussion today and decide to vote after we continue the, the conversation. So we could look at BHE and how it integrates 
this with this next meeting, next time we discuss this. Yeah. Can, can I make a, a yes? Uh, I was wondering if I, can, if I can make a recommendation. It may be to all the benefit of the discussion is that we do a little bit more research before going any further with this at this point. You mean with Colby? With Colby and MASC. Because I was going under a set of assumptions which now are not accurate. So I think it may be best to, I don't know, table the right word? I don't um, table probably is the yeah, word. table. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm not opposed to that. I think there's a few things that I think we, addressed. you know, we can call her or I can call. Yeah, her. I can. We I can change the title. I can right do more research on it. I, I, I'm sorry. I apologize. I thought that it was a completely different direction. I thought we could just add another one. Like the SM. So. I started a process of cataloging our policies versus MSC, but I don't have it done yet. Otherwise, I could quickly answer the question. Um, but I'm, if, if there is a motion, I'll even make it to table it for now until we um, answer some of these questions, clarify some of these questions, as the case may be. Um, I don't think it needs to be specially wordsmith, but I'll just motion to table the second reading of. Policy, BHE, social media, uh, until we've answered some questions. With no date in particular. I'll second it. All those in favor? Yeah. Six zero. <clears throat> okay. You're up. I'm up. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So in your packet is a memo uh, describing some possible options for the committee to consider uh, regarding the superintendent evaluation process. Um, this is based on uh, some best practices uh, that have uh, been communicated uh, at different workshops um, that MASS, MASC, and DESE have been putting on Recently, as you know, that there's a new rubric for superintendents, which is currently uh, districts are piloting. Um, and so in what I did is I attached a presentation that talks about some of the best practices. And two, two of the best practices refer to superintendents that have, that are uh, experienced three years or more in terms of uh, frequency and timeline of the process and for superintendents are, that are in good standing. So the two, the two best practices that I would like the committee to have a conversation about is going from a one-year evaluation cycle to a two-year evaluation cycle. And I have included what that timeline would look like. And that's a sample timeline from, from the DESE um, booklet regarding the superintendent evaluation. And changing the timing uh, of the summative evaluation. So, two options that DESE has recommended uh, as best practices um, is either using the current cycle, which is a fiscal year cycle, or you go with an election year cycle. There are pros and cons to both. Um, certainly, with an election year cycle, the school committee that is in place is the one evaluating the superintendent. Whereas when you go a fiscal year cycle, you, there is the possibility that you have members that have only been on the board a month that are going to be either submitting or not submitting an evaluation. Uh, giving them that, I don't know, burden is the right word, but additional responsibility when they don't have a lot of information and data. And one of the things that MASC does recommend um, is that if a board member has been on six months or less, that you may not want to participate fully in the evaluation process for that very reason. So there are essentially some options to consider here as, as a committee. One is uh, to complete the entire evaluation cycle by March. 
Another is to keep the current evaluation cycle completed by June. Another one is to go to a two-year cycle, with this being the year one, and completing it by June of 2021, or going with a two-year cycle, with this being year one, and completing it by the next election, which is April of 2021. So in terms of goals, um, the goals would remain <coughs> annual goals, which is what DESE recommends. But as you know also, we will be having a district improvement plan, which is going to be a three-year plan, um, which would also be part of the evaluation process. So that's essentially the introduction. And just I think we're at a point where we, I need some guidance in terms of the fact that we are going to have um, three brand new school committee members in March. Um, is really prompting this discussion and I'm looking for some guidance on how the committee wants to proceed moving forward. I may have misheard something you just said, Dr. Doherty, so I'm going to ask for clarification. Did you say that you would, that the recommendation might be a two-year evaluation cycle but continue to have one-year goals or would you have two years of goals and a two-year evaluation. DESE recommends still the annual goals, but that doesn't mean they can't be multi-year goals. Some goals are only one-year goals. Right. Um, just by the nature of them. Others could be multi-year. I will say I like the consistent, I, one aspect of this I like is if we could tie the goal setting to the evaluation that's very clean. Like I'd love to see a two-year goal cycle with a two-year evaluation cycle. So you set the goal in spring of year, you set the two-year goals in spring of year X. And to your point, maybe there are milestones. Maybe by the end of X plus one, the following five of the 12 goals should be met. Right. So you, you could certainly have milestones built in, but I really like the idea of having, you know, we're going to set the goals in the spring of year X. There might be some milestones in the first year following, but the end of X plus two, so X plus two years later, is when the goals are kind of coming to fruition, and you can see where the goals met, where the goals not met aligning with evaluation seems very logical to me. So I would just something to suggest for the committee is if possible having the goals aligned with the evaluation would be I think practical. Conversely either way you're still going to have a three year district improvement plan that's going to be out of cycle. I know. <laughs> I know. Yeah. That's true. I also liked the idea of that two year cycle and reading through the materials I actually liked um, that there's that opportunity at one year to look at the goals, to do an, um, a formative assessment and a benchmarking, I think was the word they used, mm -hmm. as to where you are. I personally don't, I like the idea of there being one-year goals, but I don't want it to just be one-year goals because I don't see education that way. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I see education as continuous and that you're tacking towards end. So you might think you have a solution or an approach and you might decide along the way that it needs to be tweaked or changed. And that year evaluation is benchmarking would give us that opportunity when there are two year or longer goals. If there are district improvement goals that go three years, then I think that's appropriate as well. But there should be some one year goals. Um, and I also think that, especially with this year coming up, it's not reasonable to have three new school committee members doing the evaluation of the superintendent a month after or two months after they come on board. Um, I, um, so I like the idea of the two-year cycle. I like the idea that the evaluation, we figure out logistically how to fit the evaluation in before each new election. So it would be in the April time frame, and that might help us as well because since I've been on this committee, we've been late more times than not in terms of the feedback, the evaluation to the superintendent. And it's not fair because it holds everything up the contract, the, the um, salary, everything gets held up when we're late. And, and it's written, in, it's not supposed to happen that way. So I like doing it a little bit earlier um, 
before the election so that we're ensuring the people that have been working with the superintendent for a year are the ones that are evaluating him, not people that are just coming on with a different perspective. Yeah, I think the most com important component of this guidance is the change in the cycle. So the other stuff, uh, the important thing is, is you know, every year we, you know, you we're having discussions, should I do an evaluation, should I not? Uh, and it kind of doesn't put that burden on a new mm -hmm. uh, committee member. Normally, I would then also say we start the evaluation now and not have it, you know, be a, a two-year starter right now. But since we just did one, uh, I think that I agree with the, uh, the April 21 as the would be the so then you'd have a a, a new committee having would have having been several working months. with you for right. almost a year right uh, yeah so just to um, to clarify if it was in April 2021 the process would probably start right after budget in early February So yeah. the new committee would have the, less yeah. than a year, but almost a year. Yeah. Correct. Almost, yeah, it would almost be a year. Yeah. Yes. I, I just wanted to echo what Mr. Robinson just said. For me, this is less about the particular dynamics of this particular year and more about what's a logical system moving forward. And I, I think that the prior to the election cycle is more logical for the reasons that Mr. Robinson stated is more logical. So I just want to make that clear. It isn't about this year. It's about an ongoing process that would be improved versus what we've done historically. I, I just also wanted to um, echo what Dr. Darty said about the budget season. We, I think we need to be very conscientious about the logistics of when the evaluation will be too. To move it up to Mar to um, February, for instance, doesn't work because our team is going to be neck deep in budget work and as to will add, we. as will we. <laughs> Sorry, our team, <laughs> our team. <laughs> so I don't think that that. I, I think we need to think about when will be the best time for the quality of evaluation that our superintendent deserves. John, did you? Have yeah. Um, Part of me coming in on the board, uh, excuse me, the committee, was going by MSC recommendations of not doing a full evaluation. It was looking at what you'd seen the superintendent do from the time you started. And it's very hard to say, as a new member, I've, I've only seen part of this one and part of this one, and articulate even with the amount of material we get, the results that are going to be put down. Um, because that guideline is that you've seen as a committee member from the superintendent. So that's a month and a half that I had, and that was two small pieces in my eyes. I couldn't do communication fully. I couldn't do budget fully. I couldn't hit those other guidelines because I didn't see them. Um, moving it to pre-election makes sense because you've got that standard. You've got a group that's already been there. They've already served. And, and the 2021 20, date gives them enough time frame to really see the superintendent's actions as well as the proof that he's submitting to us. A couple of thoughts or comments here as we go through this. Um, this year is an interesting example, right? This coming year in 2020, where we, the select board, has decided to move up the town election in alignment with the national election, right? With the Massachusetts, with the state um, primaries. In those situations, and they've happened before, this committee would lose a month of time to prepare such an evaluation, right? Um, which, frankly, is probably nearly, it's going to be very, very difficult to write a, a well-written, well-thought-out review coming right off a of budget 
when you have to com consolidate them, write them and consolidate them and deliver them before that March election date. So that's logistically, to a logistical question, that's a very challenging question. Um, so I think that's a challenge. Um, in terms of the MASC guidelines, it says whatever you've, whatever you've experienced or whatever you've seen, and what you've seen in many cases can be data that you pull, data that's available to you, data that's on YouTube. You, you, you can see a lot in that period of time. As a committee um, member. As a committee member, yep. From the date of election until that period of time, you can watch every YouTube you want to. Um, Mrs. Callie mentioned she was going to go back and watch YouTubes when she joined the, the committee, right? Mm -hmm. So there's a lot that you can observe, whether you, you know, whether how that fits into it is, is up to you. Um, I, I think another option that was, that has been discussed at MASC, but is not yet on the table here, would be something that I think people might be interested in is, there are, there are some MASC policies or, or suggestions that, that allow for past committee members to contribute if they just finished their term. Um, so that if you were to say, you know, in, in this upcoming election, since the two of you have officially announced, right, I'm not here after March, but I can provide feedback from June through March that may have otherwise been missed in the previous session if you're so inclined. That might fill in some of that gap as well, um, in terms of other information that can feed into an, into a, a, um, a review. I'd want to check whether with we want to do that. Well, I'd also want to check with the legality of that, whether we can do that. I thought last year we checked that and we were told no. I, I, that would have been a lane. I yeah no I I remember looking into this last year. I was definitely at the MSC training when I went to the MSC training in June of last I'm year. I'm not so. saying you're <laughs> wrong. I'm just saying I definitely would want to. I mean, it makes sense to me, but I'd want to check it. Yeah, yeah. I think so. Uh, and then the last thing I have, I guess, is the uh, the example in Appendix B that Dr. Doherty gave. You know, there's the year one formative evaluation, the year two summative evaluation. How detailed is that formative evaluation? It's not very uh, detailed. Which would be, I mean, it does allow for a little bit of course correction. Um, in my, and, and this is a question to you as well, sir, I've seen you present on things like what's going halfway through the session, how are we doing type thing, but not necessarily where there's the committee saying, okay, well, what else do we need to add? What else do we need to do? It's not been a back and forth necessarily, but this seems to imply kind of a back and forth type process. Yeah, when I mean not as detailed, I mean on your part. Yep the level of detail that you would do for a summative is not as great for a formative. Okay. So, I mean, I think that's also a question is what does that formative look like? I mean, I think there's a lot of questions here that might be, again, too early to answer, but uh, I'm just putting that out there. Yes. So I have a reaction to the, I had two different very opposite reactions to the thought of prior school committee members who are just off serving participating um, and it comes from the perspective of someone who's on several years been the compiler I think it creates a challenge so I'm putting myself back in that position so I get all the individual evaluations and have to put them into one how do I weight a brand new school committee members right now it's all equal so if you know two people get elected and one says I'm not going to do an evaluation I have not had adequate experience to do a proper job and someone else says I definitely have I'm ready to do this that's all equal but if now you add in two people who are no longer two or three people or one or two or three people who are no longer serving on the committee who are providing kind of historic evaluation now I've got nine evaluations and so the legality question is a really big one I mean Dr. Doherty any superintendent reports to the existing board um, but I do think there would be a compiling question about how you almost wait because that almost becomes a, a, a seven or eight or nine person body which strikes me as unfair and problematic so I think there's some challenges with that um, and then the, I think your point about every four years in the event that an election gets moved up to March is a really valid one that's a really tight time frame but it, I would weigh that against what I just said so if if every four years we have to do a tremendous amount of work in January and February, I would almost want to try that and see if the bandwidth exists every four years to make that happen versus go down the path of what I just described, which I see as more messy every single year. That's just my reaction. I believe when we checked into this last year, um, the reason why past members could not 
submit was because the school, the current school committee has to take the vote <coughs> on the final summative. And you can't use past members as part of that. I believe that was what we were told when we looked into this last year. I mean, it's definitely valid. To, uh, I'd like to know what you know, I'd like to revisit that, and I'm sure we can find out what was said last year. Yeah. Just for your revisiting, it was Dorothy who mentioned that at the training in particular. Okay. And there was a question on the audience if we're done. Yes. Um, to Ms. Borowski's point about the, the timing with the primary cycle, um, so, you know, as long as Dr. Doherty's the superintendent's not a problem, right, because we're offset by a year with the, with the presidential primary cycles. Um, and if I understand the guidelines correctly in terms of moving to the two-year evaluation cycle, that's suggested for a tenured superintendent who's in good standing. So if a, if a future superintendent were hired in, at such a timeline, on such a timeline that uh, the two-year cycle would suggest it happens in a, in a primary year where we're going to have that compressed timeline, you, you could pursue the option of go, you know, doing a one-year evaluation for a year or two or whatever it takes to, to get back on that offset. That's a great that's point. A great point. Mm -hmm. that would be the right if I can just, just to that point, when you hire a new superintendent, the first three years have to be annual. They have to be. They're not, they, they're not that's by regulation. Still, the fourth could be annual, the fifth and sixth could be every two years. Yeah. Right. You can find a way to get to it, right. to his point. It's almost but. like professional status with teachers. <laughs> so there are four potential motions, if I'm reading this right. <laughs> and it sort of depends on the will of the committee. So I can read a motion that we um, begin the evaluation process essentially right now to complete it by the March 2020 election, which is March 3rd, <laughs> which is a lot, um, to keep the current evaluation cycle and complete it by June, um, to go to a two-year cycle with this year being year one and completing it by June of 2021. So that would be the kind of traditional school year calendar that we currently use. And the final option is to go to a, a two-year cycle also with it ending in 2021, but completing it by April with the intention, intention of completing it prior to the election so that the existing school committee every year is doing, an in, is doing the biannual evaluation as opposed to a newly elected school committee. So my, my idea to um, which one to vote would be based on what we find out about the whether uh, former committee members can can put in an evaluation because if, if that's the case then maybe we could complete the evaluation by 2020 June 2020 right you're you are right I guess my inclination right now is to move to a two-year cycle and move to a prior to an election because I, I think that's a better, more stable process moving forward. So I would be comfortable based on, unless I'm open to more discussion on it, but I'd be open to that. The only reason I think to wait on it would be if we felt that having prior year school committee members weigh in on the evaluation is a good idea. And if, there, if that's the desire, then we should hold off on it. I'm not persuaded that that is a better approach. Dr. Cox. This is my orientation coming out. If the goal of the evaluation is to give honest feedback, there's nothing that stops prior school committee members from giving that feedback. It's just not necessarily part of the vote that goes forward. So I was actually going to make a motion, but I don't want to cut off discussion where it still needs to have, um, to propose that we um, vote on going to a two-year cycle with this year being year one and completing it by April of the 2021 election, which was also what I believe Mrs. Borowski was saying. Yep. Uh, is there a second to that motion? I'll, 
I'll second that motion. Did you have something? I go back to being able to see what the superintendent is doing. As a committee member, it makes a difference. Um, there's more conversation that you listen to more intently, uh, more in depth. Not being on the school committee at the time, watching videos, whatever, you're not looking at it as in depth as you would sitting here. Um, I would, I would go along with Ms. Broski and, and Dr. Doxer on this mm -hmm. with the two year. Yes. Um, so it, it strikes me that we've already set ourselves in motion to go towards June 2020. And even that was a bit, I mean, it was, it's, it's shorter, right? So adding, adding kind of makes sense, but our goals are not set to go towards April mm -hmm. 2020 at the current time. And even the goals on the list right now, the end of them is December 2020 for some of them that are out there, but most of them go towards June 2020. We've also talked about the fact that the committee should get together with the administration, with the updates coming from portrait of the, of the graduate and whatnot, and to a degree they're somewhat misaligned, but figure out what, what the goals, the three-year goals should be sometime in the March, April, May time frame of next year to really reset what we're trying to get done. So I'm of the opinion that we've already set the course for this year. I like the idea from a general perspective, but I think it needs to be part of the next cycle. I think we've gone, you know, we've already, we're already two months down the path of this budget cycle, we've are, of this uh, goal cycle. We've set them in place on purpose to end around June 20th, June 2020, which is that cycle. Um, it's already been, for lack of a better word, the die is cast. But the idea here is I, I think it's a good idea. I just don't know that it's the right time for it. Um, so in that regard, I think my perspective would be to go towards stick with what we got, but learn from it so that when we start to the process for the next process, which we put in place August, September of next year, after having these conversations, maybe even earlier if we have them in the March, April timeframe like we've talked about, then we have an idea of what you know, April 2020 looks like that is actually something achievable and measurable. Um, I think it's a really valid point, but one way around it would be to do another set of one-year goals. So say this spring of 2020, we're gonna set one more set of one-year goals to spring of 2021. And in 2021, we will do the first two-year evaluation. We will set the first two-year goals. So you do a one-year kind of extension just to get us where we need to be. And then in spring, if we believe this is the right approach, that's a way to solve that problem. But I think you're right. I think it's something we would need to solve, but I think it's solvable by one more set of one-year goals. Because we have it within our purview to do one year, two year, or three year goals. And if the, ultimately what, what I would like, I don't want to speak for anyone else, is to have the two year goals in alignment with the two year evaluation cycle. If it's a calendaring issue, we, we did one year goals this year, we do one more set of one year goals with the explicit intent of moving to a two year cycle for both evaluation and goals that are aligned. I think that's actually built into this process because as we discussed, there's the one year formative evaluation and that would be the perfect time to hone in on the goals and solidify the additional goals for the timing of our evaluation. Um, and I think that it weighs, I don't think we can ignore the fact that we're going to have three new school committee members who will not have worked with the superintendent from this capacity um, for an extended period of time to be equipped to do the kind of evaluation that Reading is notorious, oh, I mean, famous for. Um, so I just. I so my, my feeling is uh, I could do the, as I said earlier, do the 2020, but I want to know whether we can use your information. If we can't, then I'm going to go probably go to option four. So I guess what I'm saying, I don't know whether I want to even vote on this okay. tonight until I have that information. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Could I? Yeah. I would just. I would. 
I know it wasn't multiple, but I would second that thought that, yeah, I, I'm kind of feeling the same way just as somebody who hasn't been here very long, just thinking about, I'd like to see how that would work. What would the, how would the contributions of the previous members work out? Because I understand too, you're saying, but they're not here to vote, but yeah, how, what would that input look I like? I think if we don't have that, if we can't do that, I don't want to put the burden on three new members. Now, some may want to dive in and, and just, as to your point, use YouTube and all that, but we can't force somebody to do that. We could end up getting a, you know, a one-page event. You know, I'm just, it's concern. It's all right when it's one or they even two, but when you're now 50% of the committee, it's trickier. You know. Can I just add one more consideration to that thought as we're thinking through the possibility of staying with the school year evaluation cycle so it would happen on, in June moving forward just as it always has. Um, if we became not necessarily reliant but expecting that former school committee members would weigh in, that would really be at their discretion. I mean, when you are an elected school committee member, it is part of your job to do the evaluation. Yeah, no, I you know, we, we could have a situation where somebody moves out of state or, yeah. you know, for whatever reason leaves the committee and says, I'm, I'm not going to participate in that. So I just don't think we can assume that prior school committee members are. Yeah, I would only advocate for that, for this evaluation, oh. and then to yeah. Mr. Wise's point, <coughs> maybe change the, okay. change the cycle later. I misunderstood you, sorry. Yeah, I wouldn't want to be chasing. Uh, <laughs> yeah. I really do like the idea of the election cycle versus the school cycle. So you have a motion, so you either have to withdraw the motion or vote motion. on the motion. It was my motion. Uh, how does the committee feel about that? I mean, uh, it, we can vote too. You know. I think we're, I mean, what we've heard from the committee is we're at 3-3, three, three, so <laughs> <laughs> it might mean we need to withdraw and find out what the answer is, unless one of us changes. I, I'd like to see it actually withdrawn and get the answer, because I think a committee member, even a past committee member's information is important, um, especially if we're going to a shortened time frame versus, you know, June versus extending that out. And this isn't, uh, there's nothing time sensitive about we. So I, I was going to say this after you did whatever you want to do, but now you've tabled two items, yeah. which I would not recommend with budget coming up that these two items get addressed until well, after budget. I, uh, I don't see this as being, well, you and I can discuss that, but I don't see this as being a long uh, a long discussion once we have that information. I, okay, we, we, we can discuss it. I <coughs> sure. yes. Uh, just a side note. Um, I don't know which one of you said that you don't think that this is, Mr. Robinson. You don't think this is time sensitive. I just want to make sure that there has there's no appetite on the committee for the first option because <laughs> we didn't really discuss it. But that one is time sensitive. That is completing the entire evaluation process by. March, no. like three months. I, that's the only one I see as being like, if we're going to do that, we need to decide that tonight. But I don't believe anyone had an appetite. I just wanted to clarify that. Okay. Can I, can I clarify something that you said, Ms. Browski? Are you thinking that you would want to go back to the June time frame for the evaluation or adjust to the election cycle? I got confused with the last thing. M me personally? Mm -hmm. Well, it was part of the conversation, and I'm just trying to get a feel, because I have to withdraw my motion if, if that's the appropriate thing to do. I'm actually not in love with the idea of drawing, because I think withdrawing it, because I think that it's going to be very complicated with school committee members that leave, and there's a responsibility that comes with writing an evaluation that is going to be part of one that's voted on. I, I believe in giving the feedback regardless. I already said that. But if, it, if you're no longer part of the school committee, you no longer have the sworn responsibilities that someone on the school committee has. And that can work in any which way. And so I'm not 
really sure that we could make the requirement or the expectation that past school committees will participate fully in that process. So if they wanted to and not have it count in the vote, I think that's fine. They can show up in public comment and, and offer their perspective as a public member. But I'm not, I don't think that substitutes for having the process where we're going to do it in two years and do it before the election so that we ensure we have six people writing the evaluation who are sworn in and committed to the process. So I'm not sure that I want to withdraw the motion yet. And I wasn't sure whether um, what I heard was that the inclination was to move the evaluation process back to June. I wasn't sure if that was what I heard. So I don't know if you're asking about my yeah, that okay, was my the last specific. one. <laughs> Sorry. Um, so I, I am persuaded right now that in general, moving the evaluation process prior to the election makes sense. I think there's some questions about do we do it this year, do we do it next year? I think there's some open questions about how, how are the goals aligned to that. I think we have some, kind of some logistical open-ended questions, but generally, when I think about the pros and cons of doing it at the end of the year, the school year, and the pros and cons of doing it prior to the election in the spring, it seems to me that doing it at the election time is a cleaner, better process. At the election time, before the election Prior time. Prior to the election. That's what I was trying yeah. to <laughs> figure out. Okay. We're not and with then you're not being asked to withdraw the motion because the committee thinks there's a better option. They just aren't ready to vote on it tonight because of some information. They've got. And I guess what I'm saying is I'm not sure that information would convince, uh, Dr. Doherty wants to talk too, would convince me that that was a better option. I don't personally that's, think that's, that's your, your my, my, my opinion. Doctor, doctor. I, if it's inappropriate for me to ask this question, then just say it's inappropriate. But I think a question, it's a simple question, but to ask Ms. Borowski, Mrs. Doxer, and Mrs. Callie, if you had the opportunity to write an evaluation, would you be writing one, even though you will not be a school committee member? I would do it if it was the desire of the committee. And I would only do it through the date of my service and not a minute after. So only through, it would be an incomplete evaluation because it would end on March 2nd. But if, the, and I would only do it in the event that the committee reached out and said, we would like you to do this, then I would. That's a good question. You've already said three times you my feedback. Well, I would, I would. <laughs> okay, yes, I would, but yeah. I feel like my term in particular is, is quite short, so yeah, I, I, I would be less comfortable, but yeah. Yes. Uh, you, can you go up to the... Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, I know this is more of a policy decision than a logistical decision, but um, if you were to do this year's review in June, it does put Dr. Doherty on the primary timing. So we, you, you'd, you'd have to put him on another one-year evaluation next year if you wanted to get him back to that offset from the primaries. Otherwise, in four years, we're looking at, you know, a March 3rd drop dead for the evaluation to be complete. So just throw that out there. Can I ask uh, Robert's Rules of Orders question? Yes. So if I don't withdraw the motion and I ask for us to vote on it and the vote turns out one way or another, does that mean the discussion is over or does that mean that we can revisit yeah, this? Over. That's it. He's saying the wrong, he's saying No, you can put it on thing. the next agenda. To vote it again? You could revisit it. Only one of the people who voted against it would have to put it up for revisitation. Yeah. Yep. So if it's a 3-3 tie, it goes back to the original uh, cycle. Yeah. Yeah. Where it could get stuck. Mm -hmm. Unless. So I never heard, Pat, I, <laughs> Callie, I never heard your 
you were coming up. I didn't hear what you said about. Oh, so yeah, I just feel like my term in particular is so short. I think, you know, if I was looking at June 2020, I would not be that comfortable where giving a full evaluation. Mine would be you know, a one paragraph. <laughs> um, so yeah. Um, but yeah, this year is particularly hard, I think, to try to look at this. Yes. You just brought up an issue I hadn't thought of, but it seems like an easy fix to say, oh, well, we'll keep it in June, but we'll ask former members to participate, except what if a former member only had a partial term? So then you almost have the school committee picking who will participate, which I think is really problematic. So you just brought up something I didn't even think of, well, yeah. which I think is a valid concern. I think the more we talk about it, I think it's more, almost more important to get back to the April timing that we were talking about, in my opinion. Yes, Dr. Corm. I don't know if this will be helpful, but I, I sort of feel like if you want to move to an election year cycle, so that uh, this would probably be a good year because you did the evaluation kind of late into the fall already. So you're kind of already partly into this. You know, you'll, if you do it in June of 2020, you're really only looking at kind of a nine months since the last thing. So. It seems like you know this might be a good time to switch to that election year and do the evaluation for a year and a half in April 2021, and then see in April 2021 how did that work with the overlap with the budget in the February March time frame? Do you want to stick with that, or do you want to go back? Um, I'm I'm not yeah. not sure whether I like the two year versus the one year, uh, just in terms of you know we do see a lot of turnover. Um, you know, for various reasons on, on the committee. Um, I, I feel like there are a lot of different things where people would want to weigh in on, and if you went to a two-year, they might not get a chance to weigh in. But I, I think if you want to switch to the election year cycle, now is a, a good time to try that out. Yeah, so I came in here thinking that this is the time to do that because the committee's turning over, and as I said, I didn't want to put the burden on um, uh, three new members to to have to do an evaluation and so but I and but I also don't want to do another one right now because we just did one in in yeah. October but you know the more we've talked about this it it seems like it's getting more complicated and I'm probably leaning back to, to where I originally came in here which was option four because uh, I guess yeah. you know if we were to have the, the three evaluations from the members that we, we I guess have half you know four months of Pat and maybe ask Elaine for the other and I just don't want to get into all of that uh, <laughs> don't forget I about don't Elaine think, so. so just a, yes. a point of clarification of what I thought I heard from Dorothy Presser Right. Mm -hmm. It was the most recently leaving seats, school committee members. It's not a selection. It's not, and then it's up to them if they're going to contribute. Right. So, we're not saying, oh well, Elaine left in September, so we should still go back to her because she had July, August, and <coughs> part of September. That's not what the recommendation was. It was who just left the seat and was replaced by somebody else. So it would be the three ladies here, presuming Pat's not running, which. Um, is there and and then it's up to them if they want to contribute so it's not selecting it's not arbitrarily and that's not selecting. what I said I right. I'm going it on the basis of what Pat said where now we're probably only in fairness gonna get two out of the three so I wasn't say I would wasn't saying we'd select two to two. I was I saying uh, my point was because I was thinking we were gonna have three and then I hadn't really Sorry. thought about her only being here for since November. I yeah, didn't didn't mean to imply you said that, but I think yeah. that was a concern Ms. Borowski raised of, of selecting, arbitrarily selecting, I think was the word she used. Yeah. So that's what I'm just trying to address is there wouldn't yeah. be an arbitrary nature to it. I appreciate that we're thinking outside of the box about this, but I think that it's a lot neater to go with six sworn in school committee members doing the evaluation on a regular cycle 
before the election. I think that's much neater. The responsibility is there, the obligation to be representing yourself as a school committee member is there. Um, and the, all the rules, if we want to talk about social media, all the rules are still in place when we're still school committee members. Yes, I will do, I would do an evaluation or I would do an oral evaluation. But I, I feel like that fourth option is the best one right now. That's where I'm coming from. And I think kicking it down the road, I'm not gonna feel any different because I don't think that we should set a precedent of asking past school committee members to fill out evaluations. It's a lot of work and people need to be really invested and sworn in to do the work. Um, so I tend to agree, number four has felt right to me. The more, I appreciate this discussion, but the more we discuss, the more I feel like that is the right approach. And I think um, Mr. Quorum's point that if we're going to do it, this is a very logical year to do it, is really, this for a number of reasons, this is the right year to do it because of the late evaluation in the fall. motion um, read my motion my motion is that we go to a two-year cycle with this year being year one and completing it by the April 2021 election I second I already seconded sorry did. I already seconded again. further discussion all those in favor I think I'm doing it opposed talk myself in five one Um, move to enter into executive session to discuss strategy with respect to non-represented personnel and not to return to open session. Oh, uh, to return to open session. Oh. Yeah, you, oh, oh, so I think sorry. you're going to have to return um, to open session. I'm going to read the whole motion again. Strike everything I just said. Move to enter into executive session to discuss strategy with respect to non-represented personnel and to return to open session. Second. We need a roll call vote. Yes, Linda, yes. Yes, I didn't have to yes. a certain order. <laughs> yes. Nineteenth school committee back to order uh, in executive session uh, the school committee uh, voted to uh, extend the uh, current contract which expires uh, the current contract of the superintendent which expires in uh, 2021 to 2022 Move to adjourn. Is there a second? Second. second. <laughs> All those in favor?